Welcome to another Walker webcast. Okay, on to my friend and guest, John Fish. It's a true honor to have John joining me today. Um, and as you will hear over the next hour, John is not only an extraordinary successful entrepreneur and businessman, but he is an elite civic leader and philanthropist. John's work both inside Suffolk and outside the company on many, many boards and commissions give him perspective to the world we live in today that few others have. The bio I'm about to read is a significantly condensed version, but hopefully provides listeners context to what an incredibly talented, intelligent, and compassionate leader John is. John Fish grew up in Hingham, Massachusetts, went to Tabor Academy, where he was captain of the football team, and went on to graduate from Bowdoin College, where he also played football, and started Suffolk at an early age and proceeded to build one of the preeminent construction companies in the United States. Suffolk has routinely been one of the 25 largest construction companies, and although it is privately held, is reported to have over $4.5 billion in annual revenues. Suffolk has been responsible for many marquee construction projects across the country, such as Boston's Millennium Tower, a new facility at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and most recently, Encore Boston Harbor. In 2014, Fish was named chair of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. He also served as chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston's Board of Directors until 2017. He was named chairman of Boston College's Board of Trustees, the first ever chairman of the Board of Boston College that is not an alumnus of that prestigious university. Fish is also on the board of the Boys and Girls Club of Boston and was named chairman of the Board of Trustees of Brigham and Women's Hospital in January of 2018. He is the incoming chairman of the Real Estate Roundtable, succeeding Deb Cafaro, a recent guest on the Walker webcast. Finally, John was recently ranked number eight on Boston Magazine's most influential list, which on its own is quite a impressive designation, but even more impressive when you consider that number nine was Jonathan Kraft, the owner of the New England Patriots, and number 10 was Abigail Johnson, chairman and CEO of Fidelity. So John, let's start here. You grew up in Boston and went to Tabor Academy. I watched an interview that you did with a young woman where you bet her that her SAT scores were better than yours, and you seemed quite confident that you'd win that bet. Talk about those formative years and how much you learned in the classroom versus on the athletic field. Well, Willie, thank you very much. And it's an honor and privilege to be your guest. I just, before I begin, I just want to congratulate you and your organization on your successes. As I read more about you and your organization, it's just amazing what you've accomplished since 2003 and 2007 and onwards. So congratulations to you. Uh, it, it's an interesting story. Um, I had the great fortune that I love sports. It was my whole life, especially when I was young. But unfortunately, on the academic side, I struggled. Uh, I'm a severe dyslexic, and I'm very, very proud to say that. And I speak publicly about it. Uh, I didn't really learn to read until ninth grade. I can't spell past third grade today. And I often tell people my handwriting is hieroglyphics. But it's, I would consider it to be an asset, not a liability. Uh, and when I went on to high school, I was fortunate to go to Tabor Academy, as you pointed out. And I met a coach there, a guy named Dick Duffy. And Dick Duffy took me by the hand, and he helped me understand the value of an education. I love sports. He was my football coach, but he said to me, you're only going to be on these fields for so much period of time. You really need to understand how you can further your education and be able to excel in life like you do on the, on the athletic fields. And that made a big difference to me. And as a result of that, when I graduated Tabor, I was a pretty good athlete. I went on to Bowdoin. One of the challenges with Bowdoin at that point in time, back in 1978, is they it was the only school in the country, really, that didn't require SAT scores. I got twin 400s. So I had very good academic credentials, and I did not have to submit my SAT scores. So I was fortunate, and because of football, I was able to get in the school. And Bowdoin really shed a tremendous light on my life. In the respect to, I love sports, but I went to a school where sports was secondary, and I had never been exposed to that. So one of the first practices I went to, 20% of the students weren't on the field. And I was wondering why that was the case is because they were in labs, they were pre-med students. And that took precedent over practice. And unfortunately, by the time I became a junior and my football career continued on, I cracked my neck and I had to leave the football field. 
But that was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me because what I realized is I had a year and a half to think about how do I really launch my career? How do I take all the athletic experiences that I had had and couple with the academic opportunities I had and apply them to my new career? And that's exactly what happened. So I feel very, very fortunate at young age that I hope to have those experiences. And as I said before, I'm very, very proud of my learning difference. That's what they call it today. Not stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so when you gave your speech dedicating the Fish Fieldhouse at Boston College, um, one of the things you said was that sports taught you the values of collaboration, empathy, and humility. Um, expand upon those a little bit and how you carried those, if you will, attributes from the athletic field into Suffolk. It's interesting is that I often say and refer to the fact that sports is very similar analogous to business. To be successful in business, it's about collaboration. It's about every member of the team feeling wanted and feeling important in their particular roles. Empathy that you referred to. To me, it's not what people have to say. It's how people feel. And if you're able to understand the nonverbal communication of your team and really read the room well and bring that team together in a very, very thoughtful way, the likelihood of success is risen tremendously. And lastly, which is important to me, like sports, is humility. There's always somebody faster, stronger, bigger, quicker, more wealthier than you. But in sports, you never forget where you came from. And in business, the same thing applies. I was very, very important that when I sat there at that dedication ceremony and had the Fish Fieldhouse, it was a $70 million building, absolutely really spectacular. I thought to myself, think of the next generation of students who are going to play and practice in that fieldhouse. And think of how they're going to learn about collaboration. They're going to learn about empathy. They're going to learn about the whole idea of humility. And think about the, taking those lessons to their business career on a going forward basis. So I, I couldn't be more proud of my family, but I couldn't be more happy for the students, athletic teams that are going to be practicing that field house going forward. Talk for a moment about what it was like when you and your wife were at that dedication of Fish Field House at BC. Was there ever a moment where the two of you kind of turned to each other and sort of said, wow, think about the fact that we've been able to make something like this happen and, and, and just the sort of the culmination of your success in being able to do something like that? No, I, I think I'm going to come back to the term humility that you brought up, Willie. Um, it was a moment in time where the two of us sat together next to Father Leahy, who was our president. And the feeling of being able to giving back to an environment like Boston College, as you point out, I didn't go there. I'm on my second term as chairmanship of the school. But I believe in the values of men and women for others. And when you walk on that particular campus, since it's not a commercial for Boston College, because I'm sure many campuses throughout the country are the same way, there's a special feeling, there's a special vibe. And what I really hope deep in my heart is that the individuals that go to that school, they're able to receive the benefits of humility, of collaboration, and of empathy. Because I really think those characteristics can help, not guarantee, success in life. So when you started Suffolk, John, one of the questions that you always asked at the beginning and ever since is why not? Talk for a moment about where the attitude of why not came from and how it has been such an important question to ask throughout the growth and development of Suffolk. I think most successful people, uh, whether it be in business or a nonprofit world or the teaching environment or the military, I think, ask themselves that question. And I put it in this context, one of my favorite quotes is, what would you attempt to do if you knew you couldn't fail? Okay, in order to have that mentality, you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in the people around you at the end of the day. There has to be a high level of confidence. In our company here at Suffolk, when I think about it, our tagline is sort of aligns with that what would you attempt to do if you knew you couldn't fail? And it's called prove impossible wrong. How do we unleash the power of collaboration, of intellectual capital in our company? How do we allow people not to be afraid at the end of the day? Because as we all know in business, we learn more from failure than we do successes. I can't tell you that when I was on, playing football, I remember very clearly 
an individual that I had a bad Sunday, Saturday, and it was real ugly, okay? I don't remember too many sat Saturdays that I was successful because I expect, expect that. No different when you were playing lacrosse, okay, at St. Lawrence. You remember those times of your life, okay? Nobody wants to lose, but competitive people will pick themselves off, brush themselves off, and get back into the game. And that's why, to me, why not? So when you started Suffolk, your father was in the construction business and had a, a company called Peabody, which you worked at briefly, and then you went out and started up your, your own company. Why'd you spin out and go do your own thing rather than just, if you will, taking over Peabody and growing Peabody? You know, it's interesting. My, my dad uh, was a third generation of a 120-year-old business. And then my brother, who's a year older than I am, he took over the family business. And my dad lent me, when I got out of Bowdoin, $80,000 to start Suffolk, which at that particular point in time, Willie, was a non-union company. And non-union back in the early 80s was at its infancy throughout the East Coast of America at that particular point in time. But I said to myself, you know, I, I sort of look at it like a, a young kid going down a mountain skiing. OK, you don't know what you don't know. And to me, my dad said, here's an opportunity. Do you want to take advantage of this opportunity? And again, I didn't know what I didn't know, but I also knew that I had confidence in myself and I had confidence in the people that were around me and advising me. And probably most importantly, I wasn't afraid to fail because I knew that if I did, I'd pick myself back up the next morning and go after it again which has happened to me over and over again. You talk about your dad being helpful in, in, in spawning your career. I, as I was doing some research on you, I, I also noticed that your, your, your late father-in-law was a very successful businessman, very successful marketer. And um, it reminded me at, at Harvard Business School, we had a case study in operations management uh, on a cranberry farm up in Massachusetts. And it was it's one of these classic cases. I think they still teach it today. And given that I feels like ancient history when I went to HBS, um, it's one of those iconic cases on cranberries. And I noted that your 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 late father-in-law was uh, got a nickname of uh, Cranapple Ed because he was at Ocean Spray and actually created the the, the Cranapple drink. Um, did you learn anything from a marketing standpoint, John, from your from your late father-in-law that helped you as you as you branded and built Suffolk? Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating question. You know, it's interesting. My my, my father-in-law Ed Gelsdorf, uh, a wonderful human being, extremely creative. Okay and had a tremendous imagination. And he had a very successful career at many, uh, probably four or five Fortune 500 companies. And in those particular positions, he did create a lot of different sort of, uh, you know, uh, commodities. You know, things like band roll-on was one of the things that he was involved in. Uh, Manwich sandwich, if you remember that. Uh, Gogurt, frozen yogurt, he was involved in those type of things. And my sense is I was able to sort of draw from him a more of a corporate approach to business, much more of a structured, less what I would say development and construction where my dad came from. My dad was third generation, okay? Uh, very successful developer, especially in the uh, you know, housing uh, for the elderly business, okay, affordable housing, and also, you know, uh, mixed use products. And, but he did things, I would say, somewhat the old fashioned way. So I was able to juxtapose both sort of a highly sort of disciplined, structured approach to business with a high degree of creativity with a more, I would say, the hands-on, okay, you know, uh, you know high-powered decision-making individual. And by combining the two of them together, gave me some pretty good insight on some of the things that I wanted to accomplish and probably more importantly, how I wanted to accomplish them in Suffolk. And I think it's added tremendously because we really have, Willie, over the past 38 years, put a lot of emphasis on our brand and our brand promise and what that really means at the end of the day. Talk about that for a moment, John, because I, I find that to be fascinating because I too found when having watched Walker and Dunlop under my father's leadership uh, and then going and working at a firm like Morgan Stanley, um, gave me exposure to an institutional world and actually gave me, to some degree, the vision of what I wanted to create with Walker and Dunlop, having worked in a larger firm and, and hearing about your interaction with your father-in-law and getting that, if you will, more institutional view of the world from what you learned from your father. Uh, one of the things that I constantly think about as it relates to mentorship and the reason that people have 
ambitions and goals like you and I have both been so fortunate to both craft and then set a team to achieving and been able to achieve is that you have to have been able to see it. Very few of us can sit in a room and all of a sudden dream up what we want the future to look like. We see something and then we say, that's what I'd like to create. Expand a little bit more on on, on that institutional view that your father-in-law brought. And I guess more specifically, anything in specific that you brought to Suffolk from the exposure to him or thoughts that he gave you, whether it be the way you formed a board of directors, the way that you set up a marketing team, things that were a little different from what you saw at Peabody because of that institutional exposure. You know, it's fascinating. I I would see that exposure, I think, truly shaped uh, and allowed Suffolk to achieve some of the relative success we've achieved to date. I'll give you some very, very simple examples of that. Overall construction and development, because we're in the development business as well, but I'm gonna speak about construction. It's somewhat of a very, very primitive environment, okay? The same tools that we're using 50 years ago, we're using today on the job site for the most part, other than some advanced companies. But things like job site uniforms, okay? Trail is being set up in a much different environment. The use of technology, the use of structure, okay? bringing in different practices that were employed in other organizations. Also the way that we train as a company. We partner uh, quite a bit with HBS, uh, Harvard Business School. I I have on my board, a guy named Boris Kreisberg, who's a sort of tenured professor, Russian professor at at HBS, who's a wonderful human being. We teach the Socratic case study method to our executives here at Suffolk. I don't know of any other construction company that does that. We learn more about our comparison companies, okay, than other construction companies. Our comparison companies are not other construction companies. They're Apple, they're Google, they're IBM, okay? They're other sort of well-trained, well-established organizations. Because at the end of the day, when you think about real estate construction, okay, it's somewhat, a, I would say, a, um, a, a, a homegrown business in many respects and it's grown very institutional over the last, I would say, 15 to 20 years prior to the the 1990s. And it's become much more sophisticated. I believe the construction industry has lagged behind that level of sophistication. And if you can present that opportunity, okay, to your employees and offer them something different, that value proposition is extremely powerful. For example, we typically do not hire people out of sort of regular vocational schools. We will typically hire people out of Ivy League schools, okay? The top 25 school in the country, NESCAD schools, Williams, Wesleyan, places like that, okay? Pomona, okay? Because we believe intellectual curiosity drives creativity. And if you have people that work for you that are bright and smart, we can teach them anything. I'm a firm believer that we can bring people into the construction business. And even the real estate business, and I say that humbly, within two to four years, you can give them a platform on which they can create value for you as an organization. That's pretty quick if you're in, a, if you're in the game for the long term. It's really interesting when you're talking about recruiting and the types of people you bring in. Um, I, I heard a speech you gave where you talked about seeking people who have confidence, put a lot of attention on preparation and respect for others. And, 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 and your comment there, John, as it relates to, if you will, attributes versus skills, like you can teach them the skills. It, it's very much related to what Rich Devinney, the Navy SEAL, who spoke at our conference last week of when SEALs go to SEAL selection at BUDS, they're not looking for who's the strongest or the fastest or can shoot a gun the most you know, skillfully. They're looking for these attitudes that they know that in that moment when you are either going to make the right decision or the wrong decision, you're going to either flee or fight, that it's those attributes that are ingrained in you as a person that are going to make you successful rather than those skills that they invariably will teach you inside of the Navy. It sounds a lot like at Suffolk, you do very similar type of selection and recruiting. Yeah, well, we do. And I'm very, very proud of that, too. We have a program called Career Start that people have the opportunity to get involved in the real estate side, the investing side, the technology side, and also the construction side. So it's a whole mixture of opportunities for these young individuals. But I would say to you is that what we have brought in Navy SEAL speakers, and one of them uh, you know, is an individual that was involved in the, uh, the, 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 the killing of Osama bin Laden, and I don't want to use his name. And he spoke to our team for over three hours. And you know he, he, he sort of uh, expounds the same values 
it, it's not about what you know, but your ability to learn and how thirsty you are as an individual to improve upon your existing skill set. How do you create currency? As I often say, every individual on this planet has a balance sheet. We have assets and we have liabilities. Most people focus on their assets. I want to focus, how do I improve my liabilities? Because if I improve my liabilities, my assets go up automatically at the end of the day. And so to me, it's really a simple mathematical equation. Okay, It's about assets, liabilities, and how do we really push the envelope okay, to try to go to greater heights? So the final kind of question, if you will, on the, the culture that you've built at Suffolk and why the company has been so successful. Beyond why not, you also ask the question or you say, find a way. Um, and that's something that consistently I hear from people who work with you where there's a challenge and you say, find a way, find a way. To some degree, that sounds like you just don't want to hear no. Um, and so I'm just curious, how much is let's be creative and find a way and how much of it is that's not the response. I, that's not the answer I want to hear. So let's go find, find it. Let's get to yes. I, I would say everybody on this podcast uh, and everybody in the real estate roundtable uh, has the same thing. OK, to us, it's one of our core values is find a way, Willie. And we didn't define that. You discover your core values in your organization. We're very, very fortunate to discover, find the way. But I also say to people often, uh, no is when the conversation begins, it doesn't end. And that's not for everybody. And I also really believe at the end of the day, and people get confused about this, I use a term, winning isn't normal. I learned that from a rowing coach, my daughter, okay? And when you think about Tom Brady, I know some people don't like him, but he's originally from New England, okay? <laughs> or, you know, Michael Phelps from swimming, 16 gold medals. Or the Greek freak last night that scored 50 points and brought the Milwaukee Bucks, you know, a crown. Do we think those individuals train normally? Do they eat normally? Do they sleep normally? Absolutely not. To really, really excel in a highly competitive environment that we are all in today, it's not a domestic environment, it's a global environment we're dealing with right now. We need to put the best players in the field and the players that are committed to excellence. And anything short of that commitment, you're going to stay in the way on the, on the sidelines. And to me, we've learned that the hard way in our organization, because it sometimes can be difficult to track people, okay, to the industry as a whole. Okay, they want to go to you no know, Morgan Stanley, they want to go to Jamie Dimon, they want they want to go to Brian Moynihan, okay, or they want to start their own private equity or venture capital firm. How do we have them sort of come to our business? and help our business grow the way it has the potential to grow, especially in light of this pandemic, because I think the best of real estate development and construction is yet to come. So talking about real estate development and construction, um, you've built every asset class. If, when you go onto your website, you can look at not only geography, but asset class and Suffolk has built everything. Is there a specific asset class, whether it's, uh, hospitals, whether it's university buildings, whether it's uh, multifamily skyscrapers that you particularly, John, not Suffolk, obviously Suffolk's going to supply any type of construction capabilities you all have in all the different asset classes. But when you all get, when you win a bid to build a specific asset class, is there something that you particularly say, man, I love it every time we win one of these? Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating question. I would say to you that um, every building we build around the country has its own unique personality and its own unique story. And we try to identify our teammates that will subscribe to that particular narrative at the end of the day. Whether it be academics at Harvard, okay? Whether it be a large project down in Miami, whether it be something in San Francisco of life sciences or mission critical or, or aviation, okay? Each one has its own unique characteristics we bring to. But what I would say specifically is that best asset class for us, I would say from a construction point of view, is really building small community oriented projects. Projects that may not be the biggest around, but have the biggest social impact. We'll build the Ray and Joan Croc centers. We've built some of those around the country. We've built boys club and girls clubs around the country. We'll build, build food pantries around the country. Extremely important to us. And we've also just recently built what is called Boston Hope. It was a thousand bed hospital 
We built it in six days, 24 hours a day, to put COVID patients and homeless people in. And I would say to you, it was probably one of the most proudest projects we ever built. But now when you talk about asset classes, what I would say to you, and it comes back to the balance sheet conversation, the most important asset class to me is people. We don't develop and build, we develop and build buildings, but what we really do, we develop and build people. The people build those buildings at the end of the day. And to me, the most important asset we have, most important asset class on our balance sheet is our people. And we really, really deeply talk and act upon that on a daily basis here at Suffolk. I had Jeff Hines and Laura Hines come on the webcast, I don't know, it was probably six months ago. And it was super fun talking to them about all the incredible developments that Hines has done around the globe. Um, but as you well know, John, one of the sort of uh, differentiating or distinguishing characteristics of Heinz is that they've worked with the world's great architects and that Jerry Heinz um, really um, made a name for Heinz by going and getting incredible architects to design the buildings that Heinz would go build. Um, you have built buildings for the great architects of the world. Um, without naming any, are working with great architecture firms really fun or actually pretty challenging because of what they want to do with the space and the design and therefore rather do something without a name brand architecture firm than with one. You know, it's, it's interesting. Is it, uh, it we're great. We're fortunate. We partner with Heinz around the country. They're a great, great, great firm. And I would say one of the strongest real estate development firms, I think in the country, in fact, we're doing about a billion dollar job from really right now called South station tower, which is extremely complicated in the sense is it it's really the center of the transportation hub in our city of Boston. It's, it's Amtrak, it's MBTA, it's DOT. Uh, and what's happened, we're building a 60 story tower on top of that as the trains go in and out because everything's live. And uh, SOM is the architect for that particular project and they're very, very well known. And I think they have done a spectacular job. But what's happened is today over the last five years and it's gaining momentum each and every day, the ability to build and coordinate a building like that with a sense of predictability, both on schedule and cost, by using the new tools that are available to our industry, okay, not just talked about, but actually executing on those tools, virtual design and construction, lean scheduling, okay, in different ways to leverage technology to provide safer environments using different solutions, has created tremendous amounts of predictability that we ever had before. And as a large privately held company, because I own the company 100% myself, I've invested millions of dollars in this. What we also have taken advantage of is the idea of how do we leverage data, okay? We are probably one of the only construction companies, real estate companies around there, that literally has a clean data lake. It's taken us five years to get there, but we can access data on a dynamic basis, not a, standard, not a static basis. And we can determine through an algorithm when things are not going well on a job, when things are going poorly, and how do we correct sort of the direction that particular asset is going in today's marketplace. So we feel very, very fortunate, but to me at the end of the day, the tools in our box are different, they will continue to change. I'll give you one last example, which is really exciting, is that we were fortunate to build a $1.5 billion project down in Hollywood, Florida called the Hollywood Hard Rock. It's where they have the Super Bowl party, and it's a guitar-shaped yeah. tower, 36 stories. A guy named Jim Allen, who's a good friend of mine, uh, who's was a CEO of the Seminole Indians, Hard Rock uh, tribe down there. We built around the country for him as well, too. You never could have built that building before in the way that it is from a technological and a construction point of view without the use of virtual design and construction we call plan and control and lean scheduling and the different other solutions that we currently use on our project called Open Space, Voyage Control, and ALICE. And those are just terminologies that may, many people really wouldn't really understand. But behind the scenes, those are the things that we do do. And to me, I think it's only going to get better. So architects that you're talking about, SOM, uh, you know, d d different people like Frank Geary, those buildings at one point in time were headaches at the end of the day. Uh, today, I think they're going to be pleasures. The question is to me, who's going to be able to afford them? I'll give you one last example. We're currently working with MIT. Uh, Steve Schwartz gave them over $350 million donation. God bless Steve. It's a building called uh, the Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning Building for, uh, for, for MIT. 
The challenge with the building is, is that because machine learning and artificial intelligence and blockchain are changing so fast and how those ingredients and solutions come together, the building is changing a little bit. It's finally settled down a little bit. But because of the tools in the box that we currently have, we're able to adapt to those particular changes and respond to the desires in a much more cost-effective way than people were able to do in the past uh, today. And hopefully it's going to get better. It's unbelievable that Steve Schwartzman, who went to Yale and Harvard Business School and has his own <laughs> university in China, has enough to then give another $350 million to MIT. It's, uh, it's quite something. Incredible um, story. Uh, I, there's so much in what you just talked about that I want to dive into a little bit deeper. Um, the first one is talking about the, the challenging project that you're building right now on top of the transportation hub makes me think about the big dig. Um, and as um, someone who is a frequent visitor to Boston, I both suffered through the big dig and now I'm the great beneficiary of the big dig in getting to and from Logan Airport and all that is done to transform downtown Boston. Given that it was took a lot longer than planned, it cost a lot more than planned, do you think that our country, just generally speaking, forget about a specific city, do you think our country is ready to deal with the type of infrastructure uh, investment that we're talking about today that sounds great theoretically, but the last really big large scale infrastructure project in a major US city was the big dig. And as I just said, it went well over budget. It took much, much longer, yet it has transformed Boston as a city. Yeah, yeah. well, it's an interesting point. I would comment two ways. One is that I look at infrastructure in two senses, and I think the, Washington does the same thing, but I want to say my, make my comments in a non-political way. I really do believe at the end of the day, the most important infrastructure we need to focus on is social infrastructure. I don't want to get involved in how we pay for that because that's a whole different sort of kettle of fish at the end of the day. But then secondly, physical infrastructure, I think is absolutely paramount. And if we didn't make those investments in the big dig back in the 1990s and early 2000s, the city of Boston would not be growing the way that it is right now. The evolution of what's happened from a development point of view over the last 15 years in the city of Boston, it has quadrupled at the end of the day. And right now, currently, even coming out of this pandemic, it is absolutely on fire. And if you take a look at any infrastructure project in your career, any reasonable investment, you will find out in a short period of time post that investment, it creates economic activity. I believe the issues of sort of the United States and the, and the global economy, we cannot afford not to make a substantial investment in infrastructure. And the type of infrastructure we're talking about, yes, it's roads and bridges, but it's also the internet of things at the end of the day. We need to really, really dig deep into our pockets and understand if we don't make those investments today, the people who are gonna suffer are not you and I, but our children and their children. And, and it, the, the data to support that comment is right in front of us. Unfortunately, we don't want to confront the facts. We politicize certain issues at the end of the day. To me, we've got a once in a lifetime opportunity to make some substantial big bets, not just in Boston, but in California, in Texas, in Florida, in the DC areas. We as a community need to put our politics aside and figure a way, like the Real Estate Roundtable is doing right now with Jeff DeBoer leading it, okay? How do we add value to this narrative to express to people the importance of making these, what they are at the end of the day, investments? And what you're gonna see, I would argue, but City of Boston made almost a $19 billion investment with the federal government in, 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 in the big dig. We received probably $100 billion in return to date so far. And it's keep on, the, 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 the clock keeps on ticking as well, too. So I'm a strong proponent, and I think it's one of those type of things that we really need to focus in on. Understanding, John, that, that you build what your clients want you to build. Um, you all do a lot of lead construction on the environmental side. You build a lot of affordable housing. You build a lot of medical buildings. Talk for a moment about Suffolk and your focus on lead is the easiest one only because you 
have clearly stated, you stated in your incoming remarks as the chairman of the Real Estate Roundtable, the importance of all of us focusing on sustainable development and building buildings that are good for the environment and also good for the people who inhabit them. Um, how important is that whole social aspect to what Suffolk does? You know, it's interesting is that, you know, we talk about the issues of social infrastructure and physical infrastructure. As, as I think about the real estate industry, and I talked to Jeff DeBoer, who I have enormous respect for, I, I think about the role that the real estate industry can play on our environment on a going forward basis as it relates to climate change and where the puck is going on improving quality of life for the next generation. Because I don't look at things from my generation. I think about what can we do for the next generation, okay? And my sense is right now, it's about reimagining. How does real estate reimagine things? And think of these two analytics. One, probably most people know, 40% of all greenhouse gases comes from buildings. It's amazing. And you don't hear much of that at the end of the day, but it is so, to me, powerful to think about that. Then you think about this analytic. The at 75% of the buildings that stand in, in, in America today have an average of 36 years old. Okay, 36 years old. So why wouldn't we as an industry come together to reimagine how we design how we develop, how we build, how we properly manage these assets around the, around the United States of America. This is an opportunity for us to take a huge leadership role on improving the quality or future quality of the next generation, both from a, a quality of life point of view, from a greenhouse gas emissions point of view, from a rising sea levels perspective. There is so much in front of us right now coming out of this pandemic. And what I'm so pleased to see how the Real Estate Roundtable is carrying that conversation, starting to bring people together to think about and reimagine our industry. And as we all know, at the end of the day, real estate is the economic engine that drives major cities in America today in small towns. It's fascinating to think about that stat of 36-year-old as the average life of the buildings. And I think about where Carrier was as it relates to technology and HVAC systems back in 1984. Um, and uh, where uh, there are not many Pella windows, but it's the only window brand that I know because it's in homes. But you know where window manufacturing was back in 1984 as it relates to um, the glass they put into the windows and just how much technology has come in and what you're getting from a, from a, from a uh, sustainability standpoint, building new today versus what the majority of the stock is as it relates to what type of HVAC system is running, what type of windows they have, what kind of elevators are in the building. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's fascinating, and I often report that if you think about it, the iPhone, which you probably have on your, on your desk, or I have one right here at the end of the day, uh, what is that, 11, 12 years old, 13 years old? And think about how it's developed over that short period of time. The I, I, iPhone 11, iPhone 12, I don't even know where they are, but in one a year. Why I bring that up is yeah. because our industry as a whole, and we all know this, is one of the most archaic industries. One of the industries that really doesn't adapt as quickly as other industries have to. I think right now, because of globalization and because of where the puck is going overall economically, we're going to be forced to. And I think most of the people in our industry recognize that and they want to seat at the table, like the Jeff Blouse and Tony Melkins and the Bill Rudens of the world, uh, Bobby Taubman's, all the Ross Perot's, all these icons of our industry, okay? The Larry Silversteins, the Marty Burgers, okay? Those people today coming out of this pandemic, no doubt in my mind, they want to make a difference, okay? Not so much for their environment, but for the next generation. And we have as an industry, to lead that discussion and ensure that what we're telling Washington, okay, allows them to get the narrative right. So often things become politicized, but this gives up an opportunity with the real estate roundtable to have a seat at the table to clarify how do we move forward and reimagine the way real estate develops in America. So um, my friend Diana Olick from CNBC wrote me this week asking about uh, inflation and construction costs. And I wrote her back and said, tune in on Wednesday because I've got the man who will tell you where uh, inflationary pressures are being seen in the construction industry. So uh, I guess this one's for Diana. So Zellman Research's Manufacturers Pricing Index reached 81.5 in Q2 of 21. 
That's the highest since Zellman started doing their manufacturer's index back in 2009. Uh, and it's up from an average of 54.3. One other kind of data point is the highest ever quarterly number pre-Q2 21 was 68.3. So we're, we're, we're 20 points, not basis points, 20 points above the, re the, the, the highest ever previously on their index of zero to 100. So a couple things. One, I, my, my assumption is you're seeing inflationary pressures across the spectrum. So it's not just lumber. It's not just cement. It's not just labor. You're seeing it everywhere. Um, a, correct. And then B, if that is the case, how are you managing your that inflationary pressure, particularly given that home builders can go out and buy the products for a home and they basically forward bought the products and that whole home they've locked in the cost of. You're building projects that many times are taking two, three years and buying supplies as you go. So how are you all managing this inflationary pressure that you're seeing in the market? Yeah, there's multi answers to the questions you just asked, but I, I begin by really talking about the Federal Reserve at the end of the day. In, I talk about, is, is this what we're experiencing today in our economy? Is this transitory or, or is this something that you, sort of the, the new era of what we're all going to be grappling with? Well, with respect to the new era, I don't think 2% inflation with the Fed sort of mandates is, is, is going to continue to sit there. I think we more or less can live in a three, three and a half percent range on a going forward basis for a period of time. But what I would say to you, I really do think it's transitory. Okay, you listen to Larry Summers. Uh, on Bloomberg on a Sunday afternoon, or the case, or some of these, or read some of the articles I've written out there. And why I say that is because let's use lumber for an example. Okay, they didn't stop growing trees during the pandemic. Okay, <laughs> they stopped cutting trees during the pandemic. Okay, so what happened was people all of a sudden ramped up once they left their houses and built new housing inventory, and lumber skyrocketed. All of a sudden, the mills up in Canada and around the globe. Okay got back to work. And all of a sudden you saw that spike come back down. You're gonna see the same thing in steel. Okay, the steel mills slowed down. Steel prices have gone up. Copper has gone up. Okay, aluminum has gone up. But I think once we see the demand outstrip the supply, we're gonna continue in this transitory environment. But once the supply catches up with that demand, there is no doubt in my mind, especially in the construction industry as a whole, things will settle themselves down at the end of the day. My biggest concern is not so much, and I say this respectfully, the issue of inflation. I am concerned about the things that are impacting inflation that we can't control. Right now in America and in the globe, we have a perfect storm, which we've never had before. We get political issues that are going on that affect so, uh, social agenda plus major policy issues in the real estate side of things. Think the, the industry basically, one could argue, is under siege right now. Carried interest, 1031s, you, you, you go on and on and on at the end of the day. Political issues, the issues people look at to the left and to the right. We've got sort of people so polarized like we've never had before. Look what Chuck's going through right now to try to solve this whole infrastructure package. We've got health care issues right now, not just to pay for but right now, there's Delta variant out there. I'm involved in Bring One's Hospital, Mass General Hospital. I hear about it every single day at the end of the day. We, the truth is told is we don't know, okay? And you saw the stock market on Monday sort of respond to that. At the end of the, it, you know, it corrected itself a little bit yesterday, but who knows where that's going to be in the near future at the end of the day. So to me, what we've got to be careful of is the influence of those particular issues I'd say social, economic, health, and political have on our overall environment as a whole. And what that comes down to, Willie, is really leadership right now. And I think right now, Joe Biden, I don't want to get political. I think he's doing a good job. We just need to support what he's doing right now. And if we have a sense of collaboration, okay, not giveaways, but collaboration, I think that will settle the markets down more than people think at this particular point. Markets in our industry don't like a lack of predictability. We yearn for predictability. So one of the things that we're doing at the end of the day is from a technological point of view, is how do we, and it's a sort of a play on things, how can we design a building using artificial intelligence that can deliver a product much more predictably over and over again so changes aren't made at the end of the day? We can, we, we can estimate costs. We can estimate schedules. Okay, we can coordinate much more simplistically at the end of the day. 
So to me, as we move forward, this issue of inflation, it is one of those type of things that we really have to be very, very mindful of. But because the tools we have in our box today, we need the best we possibly can to de-risk them, partner with our clients throughout the country, mitigate their risks from a cost point of view, and also from a labor point of view at the end of the day. So to me, I believe it is transitory overall. I do believe we'll get the Delta variant under control. I do believe the political issues will settle themselves down. And I also believe the social issues are not going to go away, and they shouldn't go away, will settle themselves down. I do believe this whole issue of reimagining where this country is going over the next five years, and our generation has the opportunity, Willie, to shape it and mold it for future generations. It's exciting. So let me, let me, uh, let me go a little bit deeper on your comment as it relates to you think that we're going to be in a three to three and a half percent inflationary environment. Well, if that's the case, and look, you're the former chairman of the, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Um, Jerome Powell has said very, very consistently that he wants to hit 2% and he won't move rates until he's looking at 2% in the rearview mirror. But if you think we're headed towards three and a three and a half percent, that would say to me that we're going to see a rise in interest rates in 2022. Do you concur? I, I, I would say I'm not sure in 22, but I would not be surprised at all in 23, to be candid with you. Okay? I do think at the end of the day is that we put ourselves in a situation okay, where nobody really knows. We've never come out of a pandemic. You think about what happened in World War II. It took us two years to stabilize. I don't know what's going to happen in the next one or two years. The reason I say that, Willie, is because of the following. World War II, we were talking about a national economy, okay? A tenth of the size, we're even less than that size in today. Now we're talking about a global economy and supply chain globally, okay? We're less reliant on ourselves than we've ever been. We're trying to correct that currently right now. So to me, what we're yearning for as an industry, okay, is predictability. I think that's one of the things we can't really get our arms around because nobody has the right answers today. All we can do is take the data, put it together, slice and dice it that we all do, okay, and put our chips on the table. So someone I, has a, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so on that and dealing with the inflationary pressures you're seeing, um, I have a piece of dirt that's entitled. Um, I've got plans and I've come to you for bidding on a construction contract and there's not a, there's not a gun to my head to get a shovel into the ground. And so I could start construction on it in Q3 21, or I could wait a year because it's just dirt right now. I'm all planned and, and I don't have a bank loan on it. Are you advising people put the shovel on the ground now because you're going to see inflationary pressures and we're not going to get relief? Or are you saying, you know what, you wait a year and I'm going to save you 10 to 15% on building that building? What I'm going to say to people is put a shovel on the ground. And the reason I'm saying that, one, we get historically low interest rates, which we're all very, very familiar with. Okay, I don't know when they're going to start going up 25, 50 basis points. Your guess is as good as mine based on what the circumstances goes, goes on. Secondly, I do think this inflation issue on materials is transitory. We're talking 5.4% 5, 5, 5. In, in inflation, I think, back in, in, in historically this, this past year. Okay, I do think that's coming down. I think GDP at the point that it's at right now is going to start gradually coming down to the third and fourth quarter of 22. So to me, when I take a look at the analytics and where things are going right now, I think in the next 60 to 90 days to 120 days is by far the best time ever to put a price shelf on the ground. And one of the other things going to happen is, as we know, the unemployment insurance has come to do right in September. Right. Okay. That people say, well, that's not going to have a big impact. Oh, yes, oh. it is going to have a big impact. It's going to have a huge impact on people coming back to work. And it's going to impact the people that we need to come back to work, the service-oriented type of people at the end of the day. Okay, They're providing those skilled uh, uh, jobs that we need to ex execute on our sites and in the restaurants and in the other environments that people really need uh, a service-oriented service -oriented economy. So to me, I think now's the time there's more predictability today than I think there will be 12 months to 18 months down the road. And so to me, I'm excited. I'll, I'll throw this at you. You know, when we think about from a global point of view, where's the issue of China and Taiwan going to be in, in, in 18 months from now? What, what we really need to be thinking about things like that in the future. And I only say that 
because I don't know, okay? But I also know today what's in front of us, generally speaking, I understand the risks that are in front of us. And I'm willing to take those risks at the end of the day, both from an investing point of view and also from a construction point of view. And I just think right now it's, it, 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 it's opportunistic. Do you have capacity? So um, not only specifically to Suffolk, but does the construction industry have capacity today? Because clearly, I mean, you want to go buy a car today, good luck because they don't have chips. Um, it's, it sounds great. Let's put the shovel on the ground. But if you can't get cranes, if you can't get labor, if you can't get cement, um, great to get the order. But if you can't build to it. So is there capacity or are you are you maxed? No, no. If you, th you think about this, uh, we're one of the frontline responders, I think, during COVID. OK, yeah. we didn't go home. So our people and our projects continued on at the end of the day. Now, granted, some aspects of our projects were, were done remotely, but the bricks and mortar side of things were done on site at the end of the day. I think we learned how to create more value with less investment, okay? Because we didn't have the, the, all the labor that we really needed during this pandemic because there were people that sat in the sidelines. But I think going forward, I think people are anxious to get back to work. They wanna collaborate with their friends. They wanna meet people and see people, okay? And at the end of the day, they want to have fun, okay? And so to me, I think there is capacity in the construction area. I think there is capacity in the real estate area. And I think people are yearning to get back to work. We need to, as a society, okay, fill those buildings back up that currently exist and build more at the end of the day. We need to grow our economy. And the only way we're going to do that is not by people staying at home on Zoom, but people getting back to work collaborating with each other, spending money, okay? And most importantly, caring for each other. There are few people, John, that I've met who have been more engaged civically and philanthropically than you. You have, as I said at the top of the show, uh, held numerous chairmanships, Boys and Girls Club, uh, universities, hospitals, um, and you've had a huge impact on not only Boston, the state of Massachusetts and on a sports program that you founded a decade ago that has helped 35,000 youth in the state of Massachusetts um, have athletics play a formulative role in their lives to get them increasing graduation rates and on to college, et cetera, et cetera, which you're looking at expanding beyond the borders of the state of Massachusetts. I guess my question is for someone who's been so successful civically and philanthropically, um, can people in the private sector do more than people in the public sector. In other words, you have taken this to an art form, quite honestly, in the amount that you've given back and the roles that you've had. Um, few of us in the private sector are as engaged as you are. And many people traditionally would say, no, if you really wanna give back, you gotta go into politics. You gotta go into either local politics or national politics to really move the needle on these issues. How do you view staying in the private sector and all the influence you have from being a, a private business owner versus John Fish running for governor of Massachusetts, which wouldn't surprise me at some day? You know, Willie, it's a, again, I'm going to come back. To, I think it's a question I've pondered quite a bit. I've uh, debated it with quite a few people as well, too. I, I think, unfortunately, in the political world, sometimes business is seen as the enemy. Okay. And, and I think sometimes in the, in the business world, politics is seen as the enemy. Okay. And you really don't know. I think we got to put our swords down. We need to collaborate. I think business needs government as much as government needs business. Government has a certain acumen, okay? And they execute on that on a daily basis. Business is, has a different type of acumen and they execute on that. What we need to do is to improve our environment, okay? For the next generation, it's not about you and I, we need to put our swords down. We need to come together. We need to help each other out. Uh, my office is in Roxbury in Boston, Massachusetts. Okay, it's where it's called Methadone Mile. Okay, I could be in a high-rise building downtown Boston. I'm not. I'm right in the middle, for lack of a better word, almost like a ghetto. I just put a $70 million expansion on that building. I look out my window and I see Methadone Mile. Because business has to go at the problem and not run from the problem. These are not government problems. They're all of our problems. They're the next generation problems. And the only way we're going to solve for some of the inequities in society today is do people really have a sense of compassion and empathy in caring for each other? I often say to people, it's an interesting story. We all are dysfunctional in our own way. 
Every family in America is dysfunctional, including my own. We all have issues, okay? And there's only one thing in the world that the 7 billion people on this planet want. There's only one thing. They need food, water, and shelter. But they all want to be loved by one person, just one person. And when they don't feel that way, they lose hope. And so to me, at the end of the day, bringing together government and business, working together and caring for each other, if we can amass that type of strength, okay? That's how we're gonna overcome these issues of homelessness, drug addiction, okay? And the inequities in society that absolutely do exist. And people have a right to cry for them, okay? It's long overdue. But we need to be part of the solution as business, not part of the problem. Government be, needs to be part of the problem. We need part of the solution, not part of the problem. I sound probably idealistic, but at the end of the day, does somebody else have any better way of looking at it? I don't know. I really don't. And what I often say, and I say this at Boston College, the motto is men and women for others. Okay? And to me, forget about religion. 50% of the people who go to Boston College are not Catholic. Okay? What they do, they have a, a, a culture of caring, a culture of put aside of who has more money. It doesn't make a bit of difference. We're all human beings. We need each other. We have to care for each other. And if you don't mind me saying men don't talk this way, we need to love each other. There's yeah. nothing wrong with that. That's what, that's what Mark Brackett from Yale said last week at my conference. We talked about emotions, and he said, I, I, this is an out-of-body experience for most of the people in the audience because you don't talk about emotions. Yeah. Um, John, uh, I'm deeply appreciative of you spending an hour with me. I uh, have to say the people at, at Suffolk, uh, the people at Boston College, uh, those of us at the Real Estate Roundtable, those people at Brigham and Women's Hospital um, are all extremely lucky to have your leadership and uh, your character leading those organizations. And so um, from all those people, thank you. From the one organization that I sit on that you have a tremendous influence over, thank you. And um, thank you for spending time and giving us your insight into how you've built Suffolk and all the other things that we talked about today. Um, as I said at the top of the webcast next week, my guest is George Hincapi. Um, can't wait to talk to George about not only the Tour de France that ended last week, but George has done a lot since his pro cycling career uh, in both the apparel industry, the hospitality industry. Uh, and obviously I'm gonna ask him a little bit about the Tour de France, but not a whole lot. It's gonna be on his entrepreneurial life after cycling. Um, and I hope many of you will be able to tune in. John, thanks again. Wish you a very happy Wednesday and I look forward to seeing you soon. Well, it's an honor, President. Congratulations to you and your organization and your family. Have a wonderful day and thank you very much. Take care.